Okay, so we'll start today. Uh, this is lecture two. Uh, in the last class, we uh, looked at the n-path filter. So first, let let me uh, do a quick recap of that. So we all started with uh, this simple-looking circuit. Let's say this is P of T and this is P of T. Now if I try to sketch H0 of J2 by F for this, you know it will have uh, multiple pass bands. Right? So around Fs. To Fs and so on. Uh, so this circuit, although it works as a sharp bandpass filter, it has two issues. One is the fact that it has uh, multiple such pass bands, and uh, most of the times this is not a big issue because to start off the strengths of these are reducing, right? And also because of this, what will happen is this. So let us say at the input you have some uh, desired signal around the FS and some other uh, stray signal at two FS. Now this filter will pass both these bands. So at the output you might have the desired signal and the attenuated version of the other. Right? Now since this is located at twice the frequency and our FS is uh, usually very large, you could put a filter, a normal LTI filter before this or after this and sort of you know uh, reduce its strength. And even if you don't put the, this will be used in some other bigger system and that system will have its own bandwidth limitations and that will sort of knock this portion off. But the uh, crucial issue was due to the LPTV nature, you know frequencies of this form will fold to F. So if you take the same input spectrum, okay, the side signal is at FS and we have something at 2FS. At the output, because of this frequency translation, we will not only get uh, this, we will also get a copy of this here, right? And not just this, we will also have spectrum from say 3FS, 4FS, everything falling back to this FS, fine? Now this is problematic because at the output you are seeing something, but you are not sure whether that is the actual signal that you want or some other erroneous signal, right? And uh, the only solution for this is to have a filter up front that will kind of suppress uh, the strength of these two. But here is where we can call our friend uh, NPath operator for help. And we know that if you do this NPath operation, only frequencies of the form F plus K times NFS will come to F. And we saw that for uh, n equal to 8, what is the minimum frequency from which this folding back happens? Seven. From around 7 fs, right? So which means now the filter unit can do something like this, right? So it becomes much easier to design and in some cases we might not even have to do this. And uh, when we try to do this n path, we saw that when we choose the duty cycle to be a special value which is 1 by n the clocks, they all became non-overlapping. So let us say this is phi1. So phi2 starts just after this. And this is the nth block. And phi1 starts. Okay. And the moment we have uh, these non-overlapping clocks, even the operations of the n circuits we have, they also become non-overlapping. So the uh, problem of addition just uh, that just became selecting among multiple outputs, right? And uh, we did the reduction, and the final circuit looks like this: the input source, we have the resistor, and we have n branches, and each branch has only a switch and a capacitor. This is say phi one, phi two. Right? 
and uh, the moment we do uh, we have sharp filtering and also the problem of folding back that also is reduced right and as i mentioned uh, without if you don't have this filter there is almost no other way to realize such sharp filters on chip so and since these uh, filters are required in wireless receivers usually uh, the entire receiver will be on one single ic and you will have a separate filter which is either a saw or a bore filter this is not an electronic filter a transducer based one right and usually saw uh, you use it for say less than 2 gigahertz or 1 gigahertz <coughs> and bore stands for uh, bulk acoustic wave and this is used at higher frequencies and the problem with these are that they are very bulky and you cannot program the center frequency as you could do here right here you could simply change the frequency fs and change the center frequency but here you cannot do and to give an idea of as to how bulky they are so here i have shown uh, the uh, micrograph or the cutout portion of an lte module that is used in uh, iphone x this is the ic actually so this is the uh, you know receiver module for lte and you see the receiver chips are probably these right and all these are bore filters right so, so you need so many filters because you can't program their frequency so since you need your cell phone needs to support multiple standards you need to have multiple filters right and even if you look at the uh, recent iphone 13 so here it's not marked but uh, these are probably the bore filters okay and now uh, with this n path filter we have an opportunity to eliminate all these uh, off chip filters and make it much more compact right and this is uh, this one is published in 2022 no no it's not published right this is the iphone released in 2022 or i don't know the iphone 13 is 2022 or yeah. okay yeah in part this world that's what i'm trying to get it yeah yeah so let me come to that Yeah, so I mean the problem is, I mean the issue is uh, NPath works but it has its own set of problems. Okay, but that is actually a good news because till now uh, the filtering could be done only using these. So the problem was completely left to uh, this uh, package designers and MEMS device fabrication people. Now there is a opportunity to make uh, this NPath based receivers. So we have more problems in circuits to solve, right? So more problems you have, more money you can make. as simple as that and of course this n path business although the original idea was published long time back only in last 5 to 10 years it has gained lot of traction so still there are issues with n path based uh, receivers and uh, yeah in the future hopefully we'll be able to solve so there is any n path is to be implicitly as soon as that given for the talking clock faces right yeah you need to generate them how do you generate this up to you can use a dll or uh, sometimes the most mostly we use this four phase stuff right and usually in wireless receivers we generate four phases of clocks by default for demodulation i'll probably get to that at the end of the class okay and uh, the last portion we saw in the last class was we took a four path filter and uh, we tried to compute the harmonic transfer functions so let me draw the four path filter quickly this is the first second third and fourth and the clock faces they uh, look like this right this is first clock this is second this is third and this is fourth and once this falls this rises so let us say i say this clock has a phase zero so i'll call it with 50 So, what is the phase shift of the second clock? How many degrees? 
90, right? ds by 4, so it's 90. So I'll denote it as 590. This is 5180 and 5270. Okay. I label them like this because now it becomes very obvious as to what is the phase shift among the clocks. So 50, 590, 180, and 270. Great. And we uh, computed the harmonic transfer functions in two, take two ways basically. First, we took the single path circuit, which is this, right? And then we uh, computed the harmonic transfer functions for this. And from this, you can find what is the harmonic transfer function for the four path. And for the four path, what was its 0 of j2 pi 0? No, no, it's 0 of j2 pi 0. We apply an input at dc. Ah, no, for the 4 path filter. I apply a 1 volt dc. It's 1, right? We apply 1 volt dc, we saw a steady state. All these capacitors will have 1 volt, is that fine? So this was 1. And uh, as he told, it's 0 of j2 pi fs was 8 by pi square. And we also actually, uh, later we took this circuit as such and we computed the harmonic transfer function and verified it. And uh, in that, so yeah, here it is, right? First we found this uh, time varying frequency response and we found the real and imaginary portion. And this was the real portion, right? And you can clearly see that this is periodic at Ts by 4, which is not surprising because we know that for a four part system, the overall impulse response and the frequency response varies periodically at TS by 4, right? So let's uh, move on to today's topics. So till now we have been looking only at uh, single-ended implementation. So let's see how we might uh, do a differential. And one way, one trivial way is to say I'll have two copies. I'll apply the positive input here, negative input here, and call this as the differential output. Right? That's very straightforward. And uh, of course, the frequency, I mean, the h0 of j2 pi f for this will be same as the single-ended case, no difference. But it turns out uh, with a differential implementation, you can do uh, slightly better. By better, uh, I mean the following. Say I plot the h0. I know that it's this circuit is going to have uh, multiple passbands around fs, 2fs, 3fs and so on. And it turns out that uh, if you can in, this, uh, in a differential implementation, not this one, but uh, if you uh, reconfigure it in a slightly different way, we can eliminate uh, the passbands around even harmonics of fs. Okay, so let's say this is 0. So we'll finally end up with only this passband and we can ensure that this transfer function at 0 exactly goes to 0 and 2fs it can go to 0. So let's see how we can do that and uh, for that I'll redraw the same differential circuit we had in a slightly different way. So I'll draw the four paths. Just one half, and I label the clocks also. So I'll draw the other half here by flipping it. And here I feed the other differential input. So the plots are same. Okay. So now uh, the goal is we want to make the transfer function at uh, fs to be same, right? 
but at 2fs we want it to go to 0. Okay. So let's see how uh, the voltages are for those two frequencies. So I'll take uh, fs, I mean I'll take a sign, we can also take a cos for example. So let's say this is the sinusoid at fs. I'll split it into the multiple phases. And uh, of course, please remember uh, these are the outputs, right? This is the positive output and the negative output. Okay, so uh, in the first phase, this capacitor sees only this portion of the sinusoid. So in steady state, it will settle to the average of that portion, which is some value, but uh, I want to point that it's a positive average, right? In the second phase, I mean in the, the second capacitor, sees only this portion of the sinusoid, it again averages and the output is same as the uh, other capacitor and for the last two, the value is going to be minus V1. Now uh, the differential half sees the inverted version of the sinusoid. So basically the voltages here will be exactly inverted. right? So now let's see what happens when you apply uh, sinusoid at uh, twice fs. So something like this. So in the uh, the first capacitor, it is going to see this portion. So it will average to some positive value again. I'll call it V2. The second capacitor sees the uh, negative half. So this will be minus V2. Similarly, this is plus and minus. Fine. And the differential it's minus V2 plus V2 minus V2 plus V2. Okay. So now our goal is to make sure that the output for this uh, twice Fs goes to zero. And basically the output is selecting the capacitor voltages individually, right? So our goal is to make uh, the capacitor voltages go to zero. And uh, we can do that because, for example, if you look at this capacitor. We have a plus V2, but in the differential half, we have capacitors that have that has stored a voltage minus V2, right? So in this half, you can see there are capacitors which have a voltage minus V2 stored. So we can combine the output of this capacitor with one of the capacitors here and cancel it. Okay, is that logic fine? So uh, let's say consider this capacitor. So what is the capacitor here, uh, which I'll use to combine this output with? No, if you take 90, V2 is plus here, right? So yeah, basically we want V1 to be same, right? So we should find a capacitor which has plus V1 and minus V2, and that's basically this fellow. Right? So, so I'll just quickly write in the positive and minus side. So in the positive, the 50 capacitor, it has to be combined with 5180. Now what about this 590? It has to be go it has to go with 270. Right? We want here plus V1 minus V2. Here plus plus. So this is 90 goes with 270. Similarly, 5180 will go with 0. Right? And uh, by combining, what should we do exactly? So, let's say you take this capacitor alone. For Fs, that is the voltage V1, after combining, the voltage must remain the same as V1. Right? And for V2, it has to go to 0. So, what is the operation we have to do on uh, these two capacitor voltages? If you add it becomes twice V1, no? so we have to average, right? And uh, here we have basically two capacitors, equal values. Say this has Vx and Vy, voltage stored. How do you average the voltage? Yeah, you simply connect them like this, okay. Right, because earlier this had a, this had a charge Cvx, this had Cvy. You connected the total charge is this, so the total capacitance is this, right? So let's do that quickly. Uh, 
and draw the positive input and the negative input or I'll actually draw it like this ok so this is plus and minus so uh, this is Five zero, five ninety, five one eighty, and five two seventy. And uh, the first capacitor we saw it has to be combined with five one eighty in the negative portion. So let's say this is minus VI. So five one eighty, right? And for averaging, I'll simply combine these two. And now uh, each of them is a capacitor C. So I'll replace it. With a single capacitor of 2C. Fine. And similarly for 590, uh, I have to add it with a clock that is 180 degree apart, which is 5270. Similarly for this, it is 50 and 590. Right? And all these capacitors become 2C. Okay. So now if you try to sketch uh, the H0 of J2 pi F for this differential uh, implementation what you will find is that for even harmonics this cancellation will ca happen so we will not have anything at DC the first band will be at FS at 2 FS it will again go to 0 and you will have something at 3 FS and basically this is a differential uh, 4 path filter Right. So, uh, what will be the single sided bandwidth here? One by four RC. Right. It's a four path filter. Again, each resistor is connected to only one fourth the time period. Right. That's all. And in general, we know the. Oh no no! This is H zero of J two pi F. Right. Which means I am applying a tone at F. Observing its response at f. In in uh, I mean, what will go to zero or h one of j two pi f, h two h three and so on. So this says that if you apply a tone at f, you will never find a tone at f plus f s f plus two f s f plus three f s. Right. So this is different. Is that clear? Cool. And in general, we know the bandwidth uh, for an n path implementation is one by n r c. So let's also uh, try to uh, analyze it and prove that it is indeed in RC. And for that, I'll only take a single-ended implementation. Okay, I'll have say n branches. Okay. So I want to find the uh, bandwidth. It's okay. So what uh, basically the bandwidth around FS, right? Which means I need to find the frequency offset from Fs where this gain drops to 3 dB. Okay. So for that I will try to compute H0 of J2 pi times Fs plus delta F. So I apply a tone at Fs plus delta F. I find its strength at the output. And I will find for what value of delta F the gain drops by 3 dB. Right. And uh, as usual I will not uh, analyze this n path structure we know that this is an n path implementation of our n pass filter which looks like this so let us say this is p of t and p of t fine and if i sketch p of t it will look like this so what will be the let us say this is 0 and this is ts what is this time instant? It is an n path, so T s by n in general. Okay. And uh, I want to find h0 of j2 pi f s plus delta f. So, what should be my input? Fs plus delta. Yeah, yeah, fs, I mean, what signal? It is e power j2 pi f s plus delta f d. Okay. 
and uh, I mean when we had to find h0 of j2 pi fs, we uh, applied the same way t for j2 pi fs t and if rc time constant is very large, we assume that only the uh, lowest frequency which is the dc is present, right. So here we had only f equal to 0 and we computed the dc component and of course uh, this component is modulated by p of t to generate a tonet fs. Now uh, we have applied a tonet fs plus delta f and remember the delta f we have assumed is very small right because the bandwidth itself is very small to start with. So what will be the frequency I will be interested here? It is delta f right Del I mean delta f is a very small frequency right so this will mostly contain this guy. And then once I know the strength of uh, this exponential at delta f, I know this gets modulated by p of t to result in an output tone at fs plus delta f, right. So I will do the same. So my vn of t is e power j to pi fs plus delta f times t and say call this vc of t. I know that the capacitor voltage mainly has only a tone at delta f. So it is say some alpha times e power j to pi delta f t and this alpha is what we have to find right. So uh, let us see how we will do. So let us say this is the capacitor current IC. Once I let us first find the capacitor current because once you know it we can find the voltage right and uh, IC of t when P of t is equal to 1 which means the switch is closed what is the uh, current flowing through the capacitor in terms of the voltages yeah I mean can VC we do not know right. I mean ok this is basically th this current is not it. Yeah, that is basically V in minus Vc by R fine and when P of t is 0 what is the current? It is 0, it is open. So I can write this current as uh, this times P of t right. So let me write it. I know each of these voltages V in is e power j 2 pi fs plus delta f t minus the capacitor voltage is alpha times this fellow divided by r now multiplied by p of t now p of t is again a periodic signal with a period t s so i will write it in terms of its fourier series fine now uh, the capacitor voltage is what 1 by c integral IC of d dt. We know that the capacitor voltage mostly has only this portion e power j 2 pi delta f d right. So what will be the frequency con uh, present in the current and the question is I mean I know that the capacitor voltage predominantly contains an exponential at delta f and this is the relation between the capacitor voltage and the capacitor current. So what should be the dominant uh, exponential in the capacitor current? Delta f right, it is a linear element right. So I will try to find only the uh, strength of delta f exponential here. Let me take it another page. So the first term here he has, uh, I mean we have fs plus delta f that gets multiplied with several complex exponentials. So which one will yield an exponential at delta f t for the first term? Let us say you multiply this with so many complex exponentials. I want to find the strength of this fellow. What will be that? C Times c minus 1, fine. And then the next term it directly has delta f t. So that has to get multiplied with c0 right. 
That's all. Again, this is an approximation, right? The approximation is that this fellow is the most dominant stuff, and all the others can be neglected. Okay, and uh, yeah, and uh, this is IC of t. So now we can find what is VC of t. That is one by C times the integral of this. First, I'll take the constants out. C minus one minus alpha C zero by R times the integral of uh, exponential, which is basically the same, divided by J two pi delta F. Okay, so I can write it as C minus one minus alpha C zero by J two pi delta F R C. Times e power j two pi delta f t. This is our capacitor voltage, and of course we also assume this to be equal to alpha e power j two pi delta f t, right? So this is basically our alpha, and we can find alpha, right? So alpha is uh, this fellow. And uh, what do you get for alpha here? C minus one by C naught plus J two pi delta R C, right? So which means my capacitor voltage is this constant times E bar J. Two by delta F T, right? Now this is only half done because our output is this, right? This is our V out of T, and that's basically the capacitor voltage multiplied by P of T. And what is the frequency in V out that we are interested in? No, what? F S plus delta F, right? That's what we are trying to find. Okay. So V out of T. Is basically uh, this capacitor voltage of the times P of T, and P of T is again uh, summation C K e power J two pi K F S T, right? So now, can you tell me what is the strength of uh, the exponential at F S plus delta F? K equal to one, right? So that just becomes C one times C minus one by C naught plus J two pi delta F R C, and this is basically our required H naught also. H naught of J two pi is one. But again, uh, recollect this we have done only for the one path case, right? We considered only one branch. Okay. So we computed for this fellow, but we are interested in finding for the entire n path. So what is the harmonic transfer function for the n path? Minus. This times n, then, and uh, this is for n path. Okay, and we know from Fourier series we have the conjugate symmetry. C conjugate minus k is C k. So how does it simplify to? Yeah, this so this means C minus K is C conjugate K, right? So this basically mod C one square times n by C naught plus J two pi delta F R C, and uh, C naught and C one are the Fourier coefficients of this pulse, starting from zero, ending at T S, and it is on for T S by n. So what is C naught for this? What is the DC value for this? What is the DC value? No, this is from zero to one, right? Everything we assumed it like this. What is it? No, why half? It's on for T S by n, isn't it? It's one by n, right? Fine, right? Okay, so let me. So this becomes. On by n, so I'll take it up. So this becomes n square. 
and I'll uh, rewrite this portion as uh, delta f times n times rc. So from here you can see what is the bandwidth. So the bandwidth is 1 by 2 pi n rc. Right? And let's do some sanity checks and see if uh, this is indeed correct. And uh, the only harmonic transfer function we, we evaluated exactly was h0 of j2 pi fs for the 4 path filter which means for n equal to 4 uh, this value we computed to be a by pi square right so what is the value of delta f 0 right so here i mean basically this is clearly j2 pi plus plus delta f. So I am saying this we computed already. So let us see if this expression is correct by putting in this values, right? Uh, this n equal to 4 and delta f equal to 0. And uh, when you do that, what do you get? We have mod c1 square times n. It is alright. I put delta f 0. I get this. So let us quickly find what c1 is. And C1 is basically the first Fourier coefficient, so we'll uh, integrate it from 0 to ds. P of t times what should come? Minus j 2 pi k. What is k? 1 k. Dt. Right? First Fourier series coefficient. And of course, we know that P of t uh, we have chosen n equal to 4. So, P of t is on for only T s by 4. So, I will uh, replace this integral going from T s by 4, erase this portion. And of course, this has both uh, real and imaginary parts. So, the real part is cos that is active for 1 fourth the time, minus j times we have a sign that is active for 1 fourth the time. So, what is the average of uh, this real portion? No, no, okay, I, uh, remember this, right? This portion has an average of 2 by pi. But this is only till Ts by 4. But this waveform is 0 for the remaining Ts. So, it is basically 2 by pi, and since the time period is 4 times longer, it is 1 by 4. Okay, this is 1 by 2 pi. Same for this also, right? 1 by 2 pi. So, my C1 is basically uh, the average of cos which is 1 by 2 pi and minus j times average of sin that is also 2 pi. So, if I compute mod C1 square times n, n is basically 4, right? Sorry, it was n square. Yeah. So, this is 16. So 16 and uh, so this is basically 16 times 4 pi square times 2 maybe something yeah maybe it's fine okay so one last comment uh, so let us say I take this n path filter okay and I have and I make the n to be very large. So, I have a very large value for n and I am applying uh, and I am interested in h0 of j2 pi fs. Okay. Uh, can you try to guess what this might be? At least you can check from this also. Here we computed a uh, more generic expression, right? So here if I put delta f0, I have, uh, what do I have? Mod c1 square times n square. So if I tend n to infinity, what happens? I mean, of course, this goes to infinity, but what about c1? It will also actually goes 1 by n square as he is pointing out, right? Because now, the sinusoid and the cosinusoids they will be active for a very short period and it is logical to see that their average will also reduce. Okay, 
and as he pointed out this will also go as 1 by n square and it will actually approach 1 okay another way to think is say uh, what does this mean i am applying uh, exponential at a frequency fs so let us say i apply a sinusoid like this right the same you can argue with cosine also this is equal to the uh, switching frequency fs right now uh, you have extremely large number of portions and uh, the first uh, capacitor let's say sees this very small portion second capacitor sees this small portion and so on so the first capacitor will try to average this small portion of the sinusoid and as n tends to infinity that portion becomes a single point and that average is basically that value itself right so what you will end up is you will uh, end up getting the sinusoid at the output completely okay. because now n is large each clock period the capacitor will see the small portion of the sinusoid and as you tend n to infinity you have a very small portion i mean simple way is to you know that if the waveform is if you are looking at a very small amount of time you can assume that it's almost constant and not changing so the average will be equal to that value itself that's all so basically uh, for small values of n you might get something like this right and as you tend to infinity this uh, step size will become smaller and smaller so you will have the output to be like this right so that's all i had to say about n path filters so uh, next let's actually look at uh, passive mixers yes in the last class i uh, with the flow i mentioned it and i couldn't spend time on it so let me actually uh, do it today i guess by now everyone uh, must be familiar that for wireless uh, transmission we take the incoming signal and we'll have to convert its frequency spectrum and that is done simply by multiplying with the cos or a sign so i'll say we are multiplying with cos to pi n t and in mixer uh, parlance uh, this frequency is called flo flo standing for local oscillator i will probably stick to fs to be consistent with what we have seen till now and uh, in practice we don't just do this what we do is we take the incoming digital bits we actually uh, take ha one half of the bits convert to analog pulses and modulate with cos the remaining half of the bits we convert to the same analog pulses and modulate with sine and then we add okay and let me make some space the reason we do that we do this is the following and uh, before that uh, if i call this phi 0 having a phase 0 what is this phase 90 and uh, usually this is called the in phase and quadrature in phase standing for a zero phase and quadrature standing for 90 degree phase so let's say I call uh, this signal as x i of t this is x q of t so the output i will have x i times cos plus x q time side right now uh, although we have the same frequency used in these two branches we can individually extract xi and xq and how can we do that sorry no this is not envelope i mean now i have added the two envelope you won't, you won't get anything yeah, they basically multiply by cos, right? If you multiply by cos, what happens? Uh, this xq has sine times cos, that generates twice frequency. So, which means you have xq times sine of 4 pi fst. So, this spectrum gets up converted to a much higher frequency. Whereas for xi, you have xi times cos square, 
and the cos square generates a DC term, and you will have this figure. So at the output, you will have uh, this xi two. I mean, uh, the spectrum of xi, but the spectrum of xq will be up converted to a higher frequency. So you can put a filter after, and then extract only xi. Similarly, you can do the same for xq also, right? And uh, now this is good because now we have not increased the bandwidth. The same frequency are used, no increase in bandwidth, and uh, but by doing this, you are able to pack in twice the number of bits, right? Because uh, if you are just doing this, you'll be sending some bits, but the same number of bits is all. I mean, uh, different same number of bits is also sent in the other branch. So the number of bits you can transmit for the same bandwidth and the same carrier frequency is actually doubled. And of course, this is called uh, IQ modulation. Okay. And uh, to demodulate it, as we just saw, we'll have to take the incoming signal, multiply it with phi zero. That will give the in-phase uh, in component I'll call y i. This is let's say y of t. And to get the quadrature component, I'll multiply with Phi 90. That will give me Y Q. Okay. Now, uh, ideally, we should be multiplying with cos and sine. But as we have been seeing all along, uh, uh, generating I mean multiplying with cos and sine is not practical. So instead, we'll be multiplying with uh, square waves. So let's say we have a 50% duty cycle square wave. This is five zero, and phi ninety will be basically uh, ninety degree phase shifted version. Right? Again, this goes from zero to one. Okay, but uh, this is again uh, not very efficient because if you think about it, we are uh, the signal here is zero for half the time, right? And we are multiplying it only in the other half, so we may be much better off. If we are actually multiplying with the wave that goes from minus one to one, right? Because in that case you will have twice the uh, gain you would have, isn't it? That's fine. I mean, the simple uh, reasoning is, if we have zero to one, what is the strength of the uh, fundamental sinusoid here? Here it will be two by pi. Here it will be four by pi, right? So if you multiply with minus one to one, you will be multiplying with the sine wave with twice the gain, twice the amplitude. And uh, how we multiply with minus one to one is this: we can treat this waveform as this five zero waveform minus another waveform that does something like this. Fine. If I take the difference between the two, that's going to give me one to minus one. Okay. So, what is the phase shift of this? This here, and uh, the rising edge comes half clock cycle later. So, it's 180 degree phase shifted. So, what we'll do is this. So, let me. We'll take the same signal, multiply it by 180, and take the difference, right? That is same as uh, multiplying with a square wave going from minus one to one. Okay, so now the output is differential. So I'll call by i plus and y i minus. You'll have to do the same for uh, the quadrature component also. So this is let us say y q plus. Here it will be phi two seventy, and that's y q minus. Okay. And uh, this kind of mixer architecture is called the single balanced mixer because the input is basically single ended, whereas the clocks you use and the output you have is differential. Okay. Now, uh, this each individual mixer basically multiplies the input with zeros and ones. And that's pretty straightforward to implement. So this portion, 
you can implement it like this. Right, just two switches. And this directly goes to the input of the next stage. And let's say it has a load capacitance like this. Okay. And uh, as we saw with the bandpass filter case, this switch is basically discharging the capacitor output. So we can actually get rid of this and just and again I'm just reminding that this is these two are not exactly equivalent, right? You can think of this portion as being derived from this. So okay. So now let's replace each of these mixer blocks by this switch and capacitor. I take the incoming signal. So this this multiplication with five zero, and this is giving me y i plus. Similarly, I will multiply with another clock to give y i minus. And what is the phase here? One eighty. So this is with the in phase part, and for the quadrature part, for the single inter case, I would have just multiplied with five ninety. But now it's a differential output, so we have a 180 degree phase shift at clock, which is pi 270. This is the okay. Now, uh, in practice, you will implement this switch using MOS transistors, and as you know, uh, MOS transistors has parasitic capacitors between each of its terminals, right? So uh, and let's say this is the capacitor that you have. Okay. So this is the capacitor that is probably the capacitor that you are putting or the load from the next stage, and these are the unwanted parasitic capacitors you have because of the MOSFET. Now you apply some clock here. When the clock rises, we have a path like this. So a fraction of this rising as well as falling edge will appear at the output. So uh, what you will actually get finally will be some fraction alpha times phi 0 here and similarly alpha times phi 180 okay. and same here also. Now without going through the details of uh, why this act of clock feeding to the output is a problem, it is at least uh, clear that this is not desirable. This is not what we wanted. Okay. So let's see how we can actually uh, try to solve this. And for that, let me only take the in phase portion. So one way to think about uh, solving this problem is to observe that here, if I also add phi one eighty, and here if I add phi zero. Now if I take the difference between these two outputs, the clock feed through term completely cancels. So how can I, I mean I already have uh, this portion due to the switch. So how can I generate uh, this portion alpha phi 180? I mean the alpha phi 0 that came because of this switch, right? From here to output we had something. So I need to generate alpha phi 180. So I'll take the same switch. So as I was saying, uh, the this clock was feeding to the output because of the switch and the control that we are giving to the switch. We want to generate the same amount of feed through for the clock phi 180. So I'll take the same identical switch. I'll clock it with phi 180. And connect here. Okay. Similarly, here I'll do phi zero. So, what about this terminal? What do I do? Yeah. So, okay. Others any uh, inputs? What do we do for these? I mean, okay, where do you want them to be connected now? Yeah, actually, uh, grounding is also fine, actually. I mean, the one thing you shouldn't do is you shouldn't connect it here. Right? I guess that's obvious, right? Because then difference will be zero. 
So as you mentioned, you can actually connect it to ground, that works. But what is even more efficient is, let us say you have a differential input. Okay, so I call it y plus and y minus. You can actually connect it to the other differential input. So now uh, if I try to calculate uh, this portion, This, which is basically the required term, right? Uh, I'll have due to this which I'll have y plus times phi zero. Here I'll have due to this which similarly due to this which I'll have y minus times phi one eighty, and here uh, this portion. That will give me y plus times phi 180 plus y minus times phi 0, right? So if I take the difference, you will find that this is basically this, right? And that's what you also wanted, okay? So this is how you will do, and uh, we can do the same for the quadrature also. So for the quadrature, normally I will just do phi 90. And phi to seventy. Now to cancel this clock phi through, I'll connect the other clock here. That's fine. So now this will be y q plus y q minus. Okay. And uh, this is called the double balanced mixer. Because now even your input is differential, clock is differential, and output is also differential. Okay, and uh, let me copy this. In this double balanced mixer, uh, the clocks we have assumed are like this, so with fifty percent duty cycle, right? So this will be five zero. Phi 90 will be this. Phi 180 will look like this. And Phi 270 will be inverted version of Phi 90. Okay. Now, of course, uh, you don't necessarily have to choose a duty cycle of half. So, you can choose any duty cycle in general. So let's see uh, choosing what duty cycle is actually uh, better and uh, for that I will only consider one arm right, because everything else is just copy paste of this. So what I am interested in is let us say I apply a frequency f. What is the frequency I am interested here for this mixer? This is switching at the frequency fs. I mean, this, I mean, we are looking at down conversion, so let's say f minus f s. Okay. In other words, if I apply f plus f s plus delta f, I'll be interested in a tone at delta f. So let's try to find the gain, which is basically uh, strength output at delta f to the input strength, and uh, we just did it right sometime back for our filter. So we can reuse the same results. Yeah. So basically, I mean, this portion with r equal to 0 gives r mixer, right? And we already computed, we already computed what happens when you give a tone at fs plus delta f. And uh, we found what is the strength of the tone at delta f across the capacitor. And we had calculated that it is alpha times this, and alpha was this. Right? This was the capacitor voltage. So let me copy paste this. Yeah. Okay. And in this case, what is R? Zero. So basically, it just becomes C minus one by C zero. That's all. Okay. So this is our still. Game. And uh, remember, C minus one, C zero are the Fourier coefficients of uh, the pulse, which basically is this. 
and for now we'll assume that this has a duty cycle of t so this is zero this is ts and let's say this is d times ts so what is c not sorry c not is the tc term which is d right and uh, c1 will compute there is no shortcut uh, this is ts times i have to integrate from 0 to dts e power minus j 2 pi fst dt oh sorry c minus 1 right c minus 1 so this will be plus fine so what does it evaluate to so we'll have e power j 2 pi fst by j 2 pi fs and the limit goes limits go from 0 to dts so this is basically this and the ts and fs cancel i will remove them out so now uh, this will write it here so here if i take e power j pi d outside I will have e power j pi d by 2j times pi. Okay. And uh, this term here is basically sine. So this simplifies to sine of pi d by pi times this is fine. This is c minus 1. Yeah. So let me write it. I know C naught is D. C minus 1 is E power J pi D times sine of pi D by pi. And the gain for the mixer is C minus 1 by C naught. So what is this? Sine of pi D by pi D times E power J pi D. So if I sketch the magnitude of the gain, and the duty cycle, the minimum is 0, maximum is 1, right? So how will it look like? Seeing right, it will do something like this. At d equal to 1, it becomes 0. Fine. At d equal to 1, it's sine pi. It vanishes. And at d equal to 0, what is the value? 1. So basically, it's clear that to get the maximum gain, you need to operate at as slow a duty cycle as possible. And that also, uh, you know, uh, makes sense because for the n-path filter case also we saw, right? When you tend n to infinity, which means the duty cycle was becoming smaller and smaller, you have the maximum gain. And uh, that's what we get here also. But in practice, it's very difficult to generate clocks with very small duty cycles with exact phase shifts. And a common choice is to use d equal to one fourth. Okay. And uh, when you do that, our clocks phi 0, phi 90, phi 180 and phi 270, they all become non-overlapping again. Right? So if you feed in these clocks to our mixer that we saw, So this is how you'll do, right? This is a mixer and these are the clocks that you'll be giving. Now here, if you, let us say there is a resistor K. Now does it resemble something? It was a differential four path filter that we saw, right? Something back, okay? And so what happens is now if you apply an input here, across this, the output is basically bandpass filtered. Now this input, basically this signal is now down converted by this mixer. Is that fine? So it's just two operations in just one single circuit. Is that clear? So you can probably go back to the bandpass. So this was the bandpass filter we saw, right? 
the same thing pi 0 pi 180 and 9270 are added and the clocks are on overlapping that is critical so the same we get here also for the mixer case also right the same thing phi 0 phi 180 phi 90 phi 270 i mean phi 90 phi 270 is here okay. so uh, this actually can be used as the front end of a radio receiver and in fact early works uh, of this solace radio receivers employed uh, this as the front end and what you can do is you can have an antenna and that will be a single ended you give it to a single ended to differential converter and it can be done using something called balance and let us say now the received signal is this where you have a small portion of your desired signal you have a strong adjacent locker okay now if I look at the spectrum here, V1, V1 is basically bandpass filtered version. So what you might get only this portion. This portion might be filtered by our bandpass filter. And now uh, the signal here is basically the desired signal that will be down converted by our mixers and we will get all the in phase quadrature components. And now what you can do is you can directly Once you have it down converted you can uh, The signal everything is in baseband right at low frequencies The RF design is done This is the entire RF design Now everything is baseband you could Give it to our amplifiers and filters and then put an ADC, convert to digital and then give it to a DSP to demodulate. Okay. So in fact like I told this was one of the earlier uh, works that used that demonstrated this solace filter, solace radio receiver because the filtering is done by this fellow. Right? This acts like a differential four path filter. So if you take the outputs here, there you have the bandpass filter happening. And the same filtered output is now down converted by these mixes. Okay. So I will stop here and we will continue later. And we will not have class on Friday.